Hello and welcome to this meeting of the Aaron and her missionaries. God has called us to feed the sheep. Amen. Amen. And as missionaries, we seek to feed the sheep. That is to feed God's people. And in our case, just like Aaron and her held up Moses' arms, we believe that God has called us to feed the sheep, feed his sheep, uh, prophecy, Bible prophecy. Uh, not not uh, prophecies necessarily uh, that people make, but Bible prophecy, along with prophecies that uh, God has given people that have come true. We need to uh, feed you that stuff too. But I, we believe that God has called us to do this because there is a deficiency in the churches of the pastors teaching Bible prophecy, what God has to say about it. Do you know 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20 says, despise not prophesying? Don't despise it. And most pastors you talk to tell you they ain't going to fool with it, right? Because they realize how much work it's going to be and maybe it won't grow a church. But it says don't despise it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20. And then verse 21 goes on and says, if he's telling me not to despise it, he's telling me to love it and to find out about it, right? And then verse 21 says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. In other words, don't just take somebody's word for it. Look in the Bible yourself, look what's going on in the world for yourself, and prove it according to the word of God. And hold fast to that which is good, that which is true. So that's what we're doing as a group of missionaries and students of prophecy, students of the Bible in general, we want to share with you the things we learn that we might fill in some voids in your spiritual life. Now, Jesus taught when we do not study uh, prophecy, we do not study what the Word of God says is coming in the last days of the church age, that we would be deceived. And many of God's children are being deceived today right along with the world. And if you really study the Bible, you'll find out that false Christianity is going to be one of the well, biggest enemies of the truth in the last days. And we don't want to get swept away with that. And that's why we believe God has called us to shine the light on true Bible uh, prophecy. Because I believe that false Christianity will one day dominate the world. And I believe that we've learned that from the Word of God. And that's what we're trying to show people. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Why? Because they're not studying prophecy. Not studying the Word of God. So they get tricked. They get fooled. That's why so many Christians coming Tuesday is going to vote <coughs> for the reprobate party of the Democrats, right? Because they haven't studied the Word of God. And, it's, and probably because you're not even saved. Or it might be that you got sin in your life that they're saying is okay. Whatever it may be, you're not looking at the Word of God. But it calls what they believe and what they are endorsing and what they are doing an abomination. And it goes against the truth. Amen? Amen. It says in verse 12, So that they might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. So, we're not despising Bible prophecy. Uh, so, we're going to give you three different angles at it to show you that the Bible does teach uh, prophecy and it has fulfilled prophecy in history. Okay? And that's one way we know we have the Word of God. The Bible says in the Bible, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 13 these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the Son of God. Now, the Bible is either the Word of God or it's not. If it's not the Word of God, then you and I have no hope of salvation, and we don't know what's true and what ain't. It is. It, it says of itself, the Bible claims that it is the very Word of God. Okay? Amen. So... In the Word of God, we find out how to be saved, and that if we are saved, and we have to believe every bit of it, or we cannot believe any of it, it claims that it is the Word of God. 
Now, if God has given us his word in the Bible, every bit of it has to be true, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, when the Bible claims to be the word of God, and being that it is, it will stand for itself. Mm -hmm. In other words, it won't have anything in it that will disprove it as the word of God. And it don't need any outside help to prove that it is the word of God. It will stand for itself. Therefore, God witnesses to the Word of God through His Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. You see, uh, God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune Godhead, witnesses that the Word of God is the absolute truth. That's how I, Karen, become to believe that the Bible was the Word of God because when the preacher preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I was a lost man in my sins on my way to a devil burning hell, an eternal, literal hell. I felt, man, like the flames of, of hell were lapping against my feet and I was convinced by the presence of the Holy Spirit that it was true. Therefore, the Word of God is true. And that if I would repent of my sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and call on Him to save me, He would. I did, and He did. And when I got up, I was different because God the Holy Spirit was living in me. That's why I've never doubted that the Bible is the Word of God. And over these 40 years of walking with the Lord and the Lord's Spirit living in me, He has proved to me over and over and over again that this old Bible can be trusted every jot every tittle as a matter of fact heaven and earth will burn up one day and pass away but the word of God will always remain and we will be judged out of those things that are written in the word of God and I also learned when you take the Bible and you believe it and you apply it to your life it works. Yes. Mm -hmm. It works. Amen. Every time. Yeah. Every time. And when you ignore it, you wish that you had it. Because that part of it works too. Amen. Yeah. Amen. God is not mocked. Don't be deceived. Whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. When applied, God does not, God does what he says he's going to do. It works every time. The evidence of the Bible being the only word of God consists of miracles, fulfilled prophecies, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. No other book does those say because they would be proven false. They would be proven with error. Finally, if you don't believe me, try it for yourself. Try it for yourself and you'll see that the Bible is the Word of God. Amen. So let's look at prophecies like we always do that proves we have the true Word of God. No other book has one prophecy in it because it would be found false. God would make sure of it, you see. But the Bible has hundreds of prophecies that's been made that have been fulfilled in history, okay? First of all, let's look at Micah chapter 1 and verse 9 and chapter 2 and verse 4. Verse 9 says, for her wound is incurable. Hold on, we're going to learn a couple things right here that I think you've probably been wondering about. Some of you know it, but I'm going to get it in the concrete so you always know from this point on what the Bible's talking about, okay? For her wound is incurable, for it is come unto Judah. He is come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Now, what you need to understand, and I, I don't think a lot of Christians do understand it, because I went for years myself without understanding it, that when the Bible talks about Judah, it's talking about what we know of as Israel. Okay? The nation of Israel. David, King David, uh, presided over a united kingdom. All 12 tribes were a part of Israel, part of the kingdom, and Jerusalem being the capital. David was a wonderful king. He had his problems, uh, like the rest of us do, but he was a great king, and he brought all of Israel together. Now Solomon came up after David, and Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived beside the Lord Jesus Christ, but Solomon had one big problem is he liked the girls, okay? 
He liked the girls and he married hundreds of women and hundreds of concubines. And uh, he married them foreign women. And he brought their gods to please them. He brought their gods into Israel. You can find that, I think, in 1 Kings 13 where he started doing that. And what happened was that brought the wrath of God down on Israel. And as a severe act of judgment, God wrenched away ten northern tribes. Okay? From the two southern tribes that were Judah and Benjamin. Okay? The northern tribes took the name Israel. Or they are called Jacob. Okay? And the two southern tribes took the name Judah. Okay, so there is a difference when the Bible talks about Israel and Judah after this separation. Israel had one wicked king after another. Judah retained Jerusalem as its capital and its kings followed the lineage of David. Okay, at the time of this fulfillment, Israel already uh, Israel was already conquered by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. You'll find this in Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 5. And following, the Assyrians are, or God says in Isaiah 10 and 5, the Assyrians are my rod of anger against a rebellious people that had turned to idols over God. Okay? God hates that. That's an abomination, of course. And uh, we've talked about that a lot, so I won't belinger the point. Then verse chapter 2, verse 4, it says, In that day shall one take up a parable against you and lament with a doleful lamentation and say, We are utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. Now, this, this prophecy concerning Judah, I uh, also want to show you the same was prophesied and fulfilled against Israel. So all 12 tribes, look at it in 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 6. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria, he took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria. And placed them in Hala and, and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Now Judah, 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 13. If God says he's going to do it, my friends, he's going to do it. And we ought to take notice here in America. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. You see, Israel first, and then Judah turned on God with some wicked kings and brought in idols, and God took them out as well. Took them into captivity. Took them away. It is incredibly dangerous to once know God and turn away from Him. It'd be better off if you never knew Him. And the same is true for a country. How could America expect, how could America expect anything different? We once knew God. Every state in their constitution said, we believe salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to see them say that now. And now we've turned. Uh, well, the Democrat Party has turned, and it's affected all of America. But we won't have time to talk about that tonight. So, anyway... Let's, look, let's move along from prophecies being fulfilled in history to prophecies being fulfilled currently. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 17. A lot of people that's my age will uh, look forward to hearing what I'm getting ready to say. And for you that are not my age, you're going to learn something tonight. Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, and this verse is repeating in the New Testament from the Old Testament, Joel chapter 2 and 28. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old man shall dream dreams. One of the signs that we're in the last days of the church age is that the daughters and the sons will prophesy, 
and our young men shall have visions, and the old man shall dream dreams, okay? I want to talk to you about a fellow named Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey was a radio personality and back in the 60s. And in 1965, Edward, you're going to enjoy this. In 1965, Paul Harvey's broadcast was entitled, If I Were the Devil. If I Were the Devil. Now, I didn't know it until I started learning Bible prophecy and putting it all together. Come find out, Paul Harvey was a prophet. You say, how do you know that? Because he prophesied it, and it happened, and we're living in it. Yeah. We're living in his prophecy coming true. If I were the devil. It's really amazing that after 59 years, 59 years ago, how accurately... He prophesied the future spiritual condition of the United States that we are living in today. Down to, down to it, man. Many of his statements were considered ridiculously outlandish at that time in history. No way, they said. Yet we find ourselves living in it today. So listen to this. I'll go as slow as I can. I'm not going to elaborate on anything because of time. But you can study this on your own. Look it up. Paul Harvey's If I Were the Devil. Here's the transcript. He said, If I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. And I'd have a third of its real estate. In other words, I said I wasn't going to elaborate, but just here. He, he owns most of the world, but there's one place that he didn't own, Right? Just a few places he didn't own. He said, I'd engulf the whole world in darkness. And I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population. But I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. And that is the, the United States of America. So I'd set about, however necessary, to take over the United States. Here's what I'd do. I'd subvert the churches first. I began with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a, of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to me, just do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good, and what's good is square. And the old I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which are in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction, and I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families that war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have memorizing Media fanning the flames. Yeah. Oh, that's true. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions. Just let those run wild. Until before you know it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Yeah. <laughs> true. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing and have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, tell me he's not a prophet, and then from the house of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. 
If I were the devil, I'd make the symbols of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give it to those who want until I kill the incentive of the ambitious. Socialist. And what do you bet I could get whole states to promote gambling as a way to get rich? A lot of you wasn't even heard of. I would caution against extremes and hard work and patriotism and moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on the TV is a way to be. And thus I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep on doing what he's doing. Paul Harvey, good day. Church needs to wake up. Yeah. We ought to be filling our altars up, mourning, brokenhearted, repenting every Sunday instead of these feel-good sermons that we're getting. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's move on to our last segment of the broadcast today, Future Last Days Prophecies. And I told you last week I was going to be talking about Israel and America. Now, the world watched prophecy being fulfilled on Friday, November, on Friday morning, September the 27th, okay? We saw Bible prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes. September the 27th uh, on a Friday morning. So here I'll show you a picture of prophecy being fulfilled. Yeah. Here we have the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, address the United Nations. Okay? Now notice all these chairs are empty with just yeah, a few people yeah. here and there. Okay, it wasn't like that when he was standing on stage. But as he walked on the stage, almost all of them got up and left. Okay, he was there to address the General Assembly of the United Nations. It happened as he approached the podium to deliver his address. As he walked forward, two thirds of the delegates got up from their seats and walked out. It looked like more than two thirds to me. It was more like nine tenths. So he was left almost with an empty auditorium to speak. The specific Bible prophecy that came to mind when I seen this picture was written by the prophet Zechari Zechariah 2,500 years ago. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 3. Yeah. You tell me, my friends, we're not yeah. living in this day. That picture bears witness to it and all the other things I'm getting ready to talk about. All right? And in that day, will I, what day? The last days of the church age. Okay? And in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. Have we not found Jerusalem a burdensome stone? I mean, that's, that's where it's all coming down to. That is the dividing point of the world, okay? And because the devil knows what the Bible says that God has in mind for Jerusalem and for Israel. He says, then he goes on, he says, all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Even when everybody comes against Israel, they're not going to win. Amen. They'll have some victories but they're not going to win. They will be cut into pieces. All right, now, listen to me. Although you, the United States delegation to the UN was one of the few that remained in their seats, it has become obvious that America's support for Israel is severely waning. Yes. Mm -hmm. For example, when Netanyahu uh, spoke in Congress, now you might want to write these dates down because you might want to repeat this to somebody. He spoke to Congress on March in March of 2000, uh, in March of 2015. 58 Democrats got our. That was this year, 2024, March 15. 58 Democrats boycotted the session. When he returned to speak on July in July, 128 Democrats refused to attend. 
100 House members and 28 senators. Also, even though President Biden has spoken out strongly in support of Israel, his lack of action has spoken louder than his words. We know he's just a puppet, right? We're talking about a movement in the Democrat Party. He has refused to send military aid that Congress has approved, led by the Republicans, and he keeps demanding a ceasefire instead of encouraging Israel to, Israel to finish off Hamas and Hezbollah. Israel is determined, and he needs to speak out and say, we're going to get you. You better lay down your arms. We're going to get you. Be with them instead of encouraging them. In the end times, in accordance with Bible prophecy, all the nations of the world will turn against Israel, including the United States of America. In response to what we have seen, American Christians have reacted in disbelief, and you hear very few preachers talk about it. Okay? And they are arguing that our nation would never turn against Israel. But today the streets in the largest cities, just a, just a couple months ago, a few months ago, and on the campuses of our major universities are filled with violent anti-Semitic protesters trying to run every Jew off, every Jewish person off, make it hard for them to be there, unsafe for them to be there, as these Palestinian agitators demanding that our nation abandon Israel in support of two of the world's most vicious terrorist organizations. Satan is using our freedom against us. We, my friends, should never allow an enemy of our allies to come here. Amen. 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 We should never allow violent protests against us or against our allies. This only crumbles the foundation of our democracy. Mm -hmm. The Bible makes it very clear that Satan knows Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. Look at Revelation 12, 12. Wherefore rejoice you heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that his, he hath but a short time. You see, right now, according to the book of Job, Lucifer, Satan gets to go before the sons of God, before the angels in heaven in the court of God to accuse the brethren, to accuse us. He's there all the time of showing God what we've done, accusing us of sin. You see, but one day his access to heaven will be cut off. He'll be thrown out of heaven, never to go back again. That's when he's going to know, hey, is the rapture's coming, right? Or maybe it's after the rapture. The tribulation is here. He's got but a short time. He sees all the signs of the times coming true. He's seeing Israel get, get regathered, the only nation that's ever been exiled from their country, brought back, just like God said they would. And that was like putting the key in the motor, and it started the, the slide of all these different prophecies being fulfilled. He already knows that he has but a short time. Satan can read the signs of the times. He, there, he realizes that the time he has left before Jesus' return is running out fast. Now listen to me. He tried, now think about it. He tried to stop the regathering of the Jews coming back to Israel. He knew it was a prophecy. And he knew that it was the catalyst or the cantilever that would trick or that would trick the lever for all the signs of the times that Jesus talked about and the Bible talks about to come together and be fulfilled. So what did he do? He raised up Adolf Hitler huh, with a hatred for the Jews and tried to kill every Jew in the world. At least he was going to. He started off in his own country and started off in Europe and trying to exterminate them all so that they could not be regathered. You see, have you ever thought about it that way, what his motivation was? In these last days, 
He has set actions against the Jewish people into high gear because he is determined to annihilate them before Jesus returns. Why? Because the Bible says that a great remnant of the Jews will be saved when Jesus returns. Zechariah 12.10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. I don't see how the Orthodox Jew cannot look at this verse and say, that's got to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's got to be the one. But they're blinded. They're blinded. They're blinded in part so that we could be saved in the first place, right? He said, and not all of them, we thank God for every Jewish person that's been saved. Amen? Amen. The Messianic Jews. And they shall mourn for him. All their eyes will be opened. And as one, they'll mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Romans 9, 27. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant shall be saved. Now, listen to me closely. Satan is determined to keep that prophecy from being fulfilled. The reason, of course, is that Satan hates the Jewish people with a passion. Because, number one, God chose them to be his witness in the world. Through them, God gave the world the Bible. Through them, God gave the world the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. God has promised that he will save a great remnant of them. God has promised that through that remnant, he will bless all the nations of the world during the millennium. It should be noted, now listen to this. Maybe you hadn't thought about this because I had not it should be noticed that Satan has had considerable success thus far in his attempts to annihilate the Jewish people. Just think, just think. You'll never forget this after I say it. The Jews and the Arabs were established at the same time. The Jews came from Abraham's son Isaac. The Arabs came from Abraham's son Ishmael. Established at the same time. Now, listen closely. Today, it's going to blow your mind. Today, there are 460 million Arabs. There are only 17 million Jews. I feel glory bumps coming out yeah. off and down me. Don't that open your eyes to what Satan's been doing? Don't that open your eyes? 460 million Arabs. Who's under persecution? You tell me. Yeah. Only 17 million Jews. Half live here and half live in Israel and scattered about. Those numbers clearly reflect the degree of persecution the Jews have experienced worldwide during the last 2,000 years. Remember when they was following the Lord Jesus said, let his blood be on us and upon our children they had no idea what they were asking for mm -hmm. when they rejected the Lamb of God mm -hmm. uh, the current anti-Semitism in America my friends has never been seen before it's never been seen before don't take it as common don't take it as something that has happened in the past for it has not you've got to remember that Satan is the father of lies according to John 8 44 and lies are what he is using to generate hatred of the Jews worldwide and here in America now I'm going to say these few things and I'm done but listen close listen close this is this is father for your fire that you can teach people about what this anti-Semitism is going on and how they have been blinded and they have bought the lie, okay? As proof, considering the current lies, let's consider the current lies that he's using to incite hatred of the Jews. First lie, the Jews are European colonist occupiers of Palestine. That's a lie. Yeah. That's a lie. The truth is, the land was given to the Jews by God 3,500 years ago. Yeah. And they lived there for 1,500 years until they were forcibly ejected from the land worldwide, scattered worldwide, uh, worldwide by the Romans in A.D. 135. That's right. Documented history. 
Following their final revolt during the 2,000 years that followed, their land lay vacant and desolate. Mm -hmm. Even Mark Twain wrote about, there's nothing there, yeah. right? Yeah. The few Arabs who lived there considered themselves to be Syrians, okay? Because most of the land was owned by absentee Syrian landlords, not Palestinians, mm -hmm. Syrians. And they didn't even own the land. The ones that owned it didn't even live there. Okay? During, and that was all from the, uh, uh, was it Ottoman kingdom that owned it? You see, they were letting Jews buy it at that time. Now, during this long time span, the land was never an independent state with Jerusalem as its capital. It's all lies. What you're hearing on the news from Kamala Harris and the rest of them, it's all lies. All the college professors, it's all lies. He said, in short, there was never a Palestinian state with a Palestinian government. There, nor was there a Palestinian language or culture. When the Jews returned after World War II, the United Nations recognized their claim to the land and authorized the establishment of their state. Here's the second lie. The Jews practice apartheid against the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. That means racism. Mm -hmm. Here's some stuff that I didn't know. This is absolutely a lie, mm -hmm. yet it has turned many people against Israel. Okay? The truth is that there is no apartheid in Israel, and there has never been. For an example, two million Palestinians are citizens of Israel and have all the rights of Jewish citizens. Do you know that? That don't sound like apartheid to me. Huh? The only apartheid that exists is in the Middle East and it's among the Arab nations. They expelled all the Jews in 1956 after the Suez War and continue to refuse uh, to allow any Jews to live within their boundaries. You tell me wow. who the apartheid is. Yes. And yet we let them parade down our streets mm -hmm. with their lies and get in office with their lies and, and, and propagate their lies in the House of Congress, in the House of Representatives. Amen? Mm -hmm. The third lie, the Jews need to free Gaza. The truth is that Gaza was completely free in 2005. Do you know that? They were completely free when Israel forced all Jewish citizens to leave Gaza. In 2005, we freed them. Millions of dollars flowed into Gaza from nations around the world to enable them to build schools, to build hospitals, to build streets, and other infrastructure items, including electricity generating plants. The leaders of Hamas immediately started, took over, and immediately started using their land as a missile launching site into Israel. And they spent their international funding on three things. Weapons, constructing 300 miles of tunnels, and mansions for their leaders in Qatar. The only thing Gaza needs to be freed of is Hamas. Yes. And Israel's doing that. Right. The fourth lie. This is good stuff. Yes. And you see what the medias are doing. Of course, we know ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, or whatever it's called. They're all owned by people that hate Israel, hate Christ, hate, hate the commandments, hate the word of God, and propagating the devil's lies. Here's the fourth lie. The Jews are practicing genocide. The truth is that the only thing Israel seeks to annihilate are the terrorist groups called Hamas, and Hezbollah, mm -hmm. who hide amongst the civilian yes. Yes. schools and hospitals. They had no interest in eradicating the Palestinian people. The real goal of genocide is expressed in the favorite slogan of the anti-Israel protesters that we've heard coming out of the mouths of angry women and men and seeing their face full of hatred saying, from the river to the sea. This is a veiled call for the annihilation of Israel. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the diplomats of the world, including the United States, are demanding a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. 
The truth here is that this is no solution at all because you cannot make peace with someone whose goal is to kill you. Benjamin Netanyahu has summed it all up well in his often quoted statement. If the Arabs would disarm, we would have peace today. Yeah. If Israel were to disarm, Israel would cease to exist. Yes. Here's a forgotten truth. People seem to forget that a Palestinian state already exists. I bet you didn't know this. Most Americans are not aware that the Ottoman Empire sided with Germany during World War I. They lost, right? And it was decided that after the war, the empire would be broken up in the province called Palestine. <clears throat> Palestine would be entrusted to England as a League of Nations mandate and the goal of leading the area to independence as a state. In, 19, uh, in November of 1917, the British issued the Balfour Declaration, which we are familiar with, mm -hmm. in which they promised to make Palestine a Jewish state. Now listen, here's what you might not here, here it is, Kenny, we talked about it. But in 1923, the British suddenly decided to curry the favor of the old rich Arabs. Imagine that. To curry the favor of these old rich Arab states by giving two-thirds of Palestine to the Arabs. Two-thirds of what the Balfour Agreement and the League of Nations had agreed on got cut off and given to the Arabs. Okay? This left the Jews only a small sliver of land 280 miles long and 80 miles wide. Israel don't have near the land that God gave them. Okay? And you think they're going to give up? They've already done that. They've already done that in 1923. The Arabs were given this land. It was east of the Jordan River. Okay? It's named Transjordan. It was named. In 1946... When it received its independence, its name was changed to Jordan. That's where you see Petra mm -hmm. and different places like that. Been there? You can be. You can see the river flowing, the Jordan River flowing down through there, and on Israel's side, green fields and grapes and all kinds of stuff. And then on Jordan's side, sand, yeah, right. desert. Today, Jordan. Now listen. Today, Jordan has a population of 11 million, and 60 percent of those are Palestinian of Palestinian descent. Thus, Jordan consists of two-thirds of the uh, uh, geographic of Palestine and a population majority of Palestinians. We've already done the two-state thing. It don't work because they want it all. And they want Jerusalem. And I had a friend of mine tell me just yesterday that he believed that Netanyahu would sign a peace treaty with the Antichrist for the uh, what they call the Abrahamic Covenant. Accord, that's the two-state solution, by the way. He won't do it. I said, he won't do it. He'd die first. Now, there's liberal politicians and liberal Jews that are in Israel that will, but he won't. He won't do it. He's, he's showing you that right now. He won't do it. The point is, we've already tried that, and it don't work because they want it all or nothing. They'll never. You cannot compromise with them. You can't do it. Okay? So here's the point. A two-state solution already exists. Now the election is Tuesday, and the Democratic Party hates Israel. Why? Number one reason. Same reason the two-state solution came in the first place. Because they need Arab oil. Yeah. Because while they're hugging trees yeah. and kissing rocks, <laughs> huh? They have used up our oil reserves and now have give, put Iran back on their feet and made them rich. Whereas President Trump had them on their knees. Yeah. You see? Mm -hmm. yep. So they need the Arab oil. The Biden administration, just two weeks ago, Sister Karen, leaked, leaked Israel's battle plans to Iran. Where's the media? Where's the media? Wonder why Israel don't tell us what they're getting ready to do when we're going to warn the enemy because they're afraid because they don't know the Lord. If they knew the Lord and His Word, they'd not be afraid of Israel's enemies. Kamala Harris hates Israel. 
a vote for her is a vote against Israel and a vote against God, a vote against the United States of America being blessed by God. Yes. America is one Democrat president away from ending our support for Israel, especially if they win the House and the Senate. Genesis 12, 3 is still true. For God's word is always true, always will be true. Amen. And I will bless them that bless thee, speaking yes. of Israel, and curse them that curses thee. Mm -hmm. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We have been blessed by our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 That's why Satan hates them, and we need to be on his side. Mm -hmm. and my friends, I know President Trump is not perfect, but neither are you. No. He's not a politician. No. He's not a politician. He says what comes on his mind. And I wish he wouldn't too sometimes. <laughs> but, but a lot of people like that. You know, that's the redneck Republicans, right? Yeah. But anyway, he will hold, he will hold to the Bible way closer. Last, his last term, he stayed right with it, man. He stayed right with it. And he knows how to make an economy work. He proved it. Yeah. He proved it. It's come down to morality. It's come down to morality. Donald Trump made Jerusalem the capital of Israel again. Mm -hmm. And his son, his son-in-law, is teaching him all about Israel. Yeah. And if it is true, which was said by a man that could quite possibly be a prophet, that when he got shot in the ear and went to his knees, he got born again. Right. We have seen changes. Yes. We see the old man coming back, but that happens to us all. But it's clear for the Christian Donald Trump is the only candidate. You say, you never heard a preacher talk like this. That's because the rest of them are afraid of losing their tax exempt. We ain't. <laughs> I'm more afraid of God. Amen. And I want to tell the truth. Right. Because one day I'm going to give an account to what I said to you guys. That's right. And if Kamala Harris wins and you voted for her, you're going to see one day what a mistake you made. Yeah. No, no matter who you're affiliated with that's putting pressure on you to vote for them, she is against saving babies. She's yeah. for killing babies. She's for homosexual uh, rights and saying that there's nothing wrong with it. And over and over, she's against the family, the biblical family. She's against Israel. My friends, we've got to stand. Tuesday, I pray you'll make your stand. I pray you will in Jesus' name. God bless you all. Amen. Amen.